I'm Megan Armstrong, and this is the Six Feet Above podcast. Six Feet Above was created when I started to share my story of spending 16 years wanting to be six feet under to now living a life full and happy six feet above. The more I started to talk about it, my struggles, my past, the more I realized that people were genuinely interested and not judgmental at all, which is what I feared for so long. And in fact, other people wanted to talk about their story as well, and for some reason trusted me to do so. So the Six Feet Above podcast is my way of helping to share other people's stories, finding out what works for them to create a life of happiness. Before we start this episode, I wanted to let you know that it has some explicit language and some very serious subject matter. It may be triggering or sensitive to certain people. Please listen with discretion. This is Philip's story. Great. All right. I'm super excited for this week's episode of Six Feet Above podcast. I'm sitting across the table from probably the most energetic human being I've ever met, Mr. Philip Blow. He is probably most well known for being 2014's Mr. Olympia. Would you say you're most well known for that? I, I would say probably because that Instagram, it says it like the muscle and fitness magazine right. and flex and all that. Yeah. So what does that mean? What does Mr. Olympia mean? How did that happen? Man. So <laughs> to, to me, it was, it was huge because that was like the end of my battle with like high blood pressure and heart issues. Okay. Uh, and so that was me stepping on stage for everybody that had like battled that. Right. And be like, we can, we can do it. So I did it for like more than just me. Yeah. Um, so it was the muscle and fitness contest and the model search over 70 competitors worldwide. Yeah. So, uh, you, you know, we didn't quite know what was at stake right. until like the, la- the, the final judging and they only had one trophy. Really? Yeah. So if you didn't win first place, you didn't win anything. (laughs) But isn't that true of anything? I mean, let's be honest. That is true. That is true. (laughs) So I was so emotional and I was like, there's a lot on the line. I had put so much work into transforming my body uh, for that particular show. And then, you know, everything, you know, when, when you work so hard for something, anything bad happens, happens. Of course. Miss my flight. Uh, the flight that I got on was delayed. I actually got there the day of the show, two hours before the show, no sleep, you know. So I had a disadvantage. Right. But to 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 stand up there and win that, yeah, yeah, that was phenomenal. And I felt like I won for the people, not for me. Right. Yeah. You know? So right. it was it was a good thing. That's incredible. Yeah. So obviously, how long how long do you train for something like that? Well, it all depends on on the conditioning. I think maybe I had trained like six, twelve to sixteen weeks. For that competition, okay, um, and I probably overdid it, you know, because <laughs> I'm competitive. Like no one's gonna beat me, so right. I probably overdid it. But at the same time, I think you know it has to do with like your mental capacity, sure. You know, more so than like the physical. Like how much are you willing to push in order to get to a low body fat percentage? Right. Yeah. And you've basically turned that passion of you competing into helping others compete now, right? Yeah. Your coach and. Um, Huge, uh, you know, fitness advocate in the city of Atlanta, but even bigger than that. Um, I wish people could see you because you just have this presence about you. I always grab coffee first before we actually do the podcast. And and we're sitting there and we both stand up and hug each other. I'm like, wow, we are two huge human beings. (laughs) (laughs) We are just big people, you know. So you're coaching now. You're helping people with their fitness journeys. But... I heard that you are about to get back on stage. Yeah. Is that yeah, true? Yeah. March 30th. Okay. Maybe sooner. I don't know. But because like, I, I think I looked my best off the, in this, during this off season than I ever have. Yeah. And it has to do with balance, more of like the mental state. Yeah. Of, of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, opposed to physical, but yeah, March 30th of okay. next year. Yeah. So that's it's the goal. Down. Where's happening. the competition? It's in California. Nice. Yeah. Very so nice. I set the date, put it down, just start working. So you are a trainer, you're a public speaker, you are a motivational speaker. Um, what else goes under your resume right now? Man. Before we get to the good stuff. <laughs> um, a father. I, I would say that is one of the, the, the biggest responsibilities and has changed my life drastically. Mm-hmm. So a father. And then I just love helping people regardless yeah. of what the title is. It's like any way I can help, yeah. I'll help. Yeah, yeah. same. I love it. Originally from Dallas, Texas. Yes. Right? You are one of nine 
kids. <laughs> like, I can't even fathom that because I'm an only child. Oh, wow. So nine is like, holy shit, that's, that's yeah, a ton of kids. Yeah, you didn't get to deal with, like, a ton of personalities before No, <laughs> no. And, like, there's there's a lot of pressure to be an only child, yeah. I'll tell you that much. Um, And you fall right in the middle, right? Yeah, middle child. Okay, so you're number, number five each way, number five, yeah. right? Um, tell me about growing up in your family, what kind of relationship you had with your siblings and your parents, religion, spirituality, all of that. Man, that's a lot. I know. This I know. Well, episodes. we're just, <laughs> that's, that's, what I told, that's what I told my producer. I'm like, we might need two hours for yeah, this episode. Yeah. So growing up was different, very different. Um, a little untraditional. Uh, I was homeschool. Okay. Um, all the way from like, um, elementary to high school. And, um, you know, nine of us, dad's a pastor, mom's stay at home mom. Uh, the rules in, in were very different, yeah. very strict. Like literally we had from the time we woke up to the time we went to bed, it was a chart every hour on the hour of what we had to do for each yeah, kid. Seriously for, for everybody. Jeez. Yeah. So if three o'clock in the day, you didn't know what you were supposed to do. Look on the chart. It was, it, it said like, um, quiet time, you know, <laughs> play time at four. You I'm know? guessing you, 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 did you get a lot of the quiet time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. I got it. I, I think I got the, the most, uh, whoopings out of all. Really? Nine. Yeah. He said like ADHD, like I got like, you know, I got all this energy and yeah. then OCD and then it just took me a while to like process things. Yeah. And then, so I got in trouble a lot. Um, but it was, you know, it was kind of, it was great. Like, like having all those siblings because like you get to learn like people's character. Right. Now I, I was, I, I always like to observe. Yeah. Um, so I get to, you know, I got to learn character. My dad was very strict ex military. Um, he retired from the military, retired from the post office and it was his way of the highway. So it was, it was more like military right. structure, you right. know, being, being raised in that family. And then like religion was very strict. Okay. Um, when it came to religion, it was like more, I would say, how do I, how do I describe it? It was like more orthodox. Okay. You know? We couldn't wear shorts. Really? Yeah. So I played basketball. I was real good at it. <laughs> You'd pick but your I, pants? But I wore joggers. Yeah. <laughs> so just imagine like, like, you, like if, you know, not, not to say that I was like the best, right. but I was like one of the, the, the best players on the team. And so before, I, before we could play it, I would I would be the reason we got a technical foul. He's <laughs> <laughs> like he has long pants. Tech. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Two free shots. Now we gotta up. work. Tee <laughs> yeah. him up. But that was uh, that was the re- that was like my dad and what he believed in the religion yeah. and like you know so it was it, it put me in a different situation like you know with the average kid is like why does he have long pants on? Why does he have like sleeves under his like jersey? <laughs> under his <Yeah>. jersey. <laughs> And so, you know, but if I, if I wasn't good, then I, I would, you know, I was right. a nerd. So yeah. if I wasn't good, I would have been that weird kid, but I was good. There's a guy we accepted. And you said, because you were the middle child, basically you like, you were too young to kind of hang out and associate with the older four, but a little bit too old to hang out with the younger four. So you really had your own identity, yeah. um, kind of built your own life rather than just being one of nine kids um, through sports, through academics. And you were a very, very good basketball player. Um, and I'm we are jumping right into this. Um, you were pulled out of it, though, yeah. before you could even go off to college. And you were being recruited at the time? Yeah, and that, that sucked because it's like – you know, you, when you play sports, yeah. you prepare for the next phase, right. you practice, you know, right. for the game, but then you practice for the next phase, you know, you know, who doesn't want to play college right. ball, especially like if everybody knows, oh man, you're going to make it, you know? Um, and I put a lot of time and energy into like practicing and playing and I love the sport. Yeah. And you know, my, my, my senior year, my dad pulled me like off the team and was just like, this is not your path. I know you're you're going to play college ball. You're going to get, like, a scholarship. But that's not the plan for you. It was, like, ministry, you know. And that killed me, Gosh. you know, inside. Because it's like, you know, my, my dream and goal 
like I told you, was like to be a lawyer. And yeah. th- like college ball was going to like put me in the school in order to like get that degree. Right. You know? So I was just like, oh, just, you know, play and practice really hard, you know. And, and you know, it's like as a kid, you 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 work for that. You right. know, all your friends are, are doing well. They're trying, you know, you may be a little bit better than them. So like you have a better chance. Right. So like you're being graded. And then so you're working really hard. And then for all that to be for nothing, you know. It kind of sucked because I remember like uh, the the assistant coach became the head coach. My dad was actually my coach. Yeah, your dad yeah. was your coach, yeah, and was, then told you he could yeah. play. So he was my coach. He stepped down. My assistant coach took over the team, and he begged my dad to let me play. He was just like, "We'll waive all the costs, right?" And so you you got to you got to think about. It. I played with these guys from um, from middle school, mm-hmm. like all through middle school, all through high school. And it was the year that we had an opportunity to like to win it all. To go state. Yeah. And it was, I went to one of the games, like not playing for the first time. Of course, they like the, you know, I've not played like prior because my dad maybe benched me or something. Right. But this was like me, like, like I don't have a jersey. I don't have a number, you know, and I came to watch and they lost, you know, and it was, it was disheartening. And most of the players came up to me and was like, if you were in the game, we would have won. And I, I couldn't watch the game anymore. So really? I stopped watching NBA. I stopped watching everything. I stopped. I, I didn't even go, come to another game. I like just started like indulging myself in work because it's like, I can't do this because it's like, these are the guys that counted on me. I was like the team captain. I, I called all the shots and here they were losing and right. I couldn't help, you know? Yeah. And I'm watching. And then afterward, it was just like, Dude, if you were here, you know, salt so in that I, wound. I felt like I took the blame for that that loss, and it was a team that like we lost to like multiple times, and I knew we would have won if I was in there, and it just really sucked because I didn't have a reason not to be on the right. on the court, right? Um, and you know, but my dad made that decision. What was I going to do? So uh, that's kind of what I'm wondering right now. Is he he comes up to you and he says like, you know, Philip, you're done. You're not playing at all anymore. Like. That's not even a conversation. Like that is just the way it is. What was yeah. your response? What was your response then? No, oh, it was always <laughs> my dad was like the the guy was like if I say jump, he was like you don't question just how hot, right? You know? Right. So I I didn't even like go back and forth and argue. It was just I, it, that just crushed me, you know. Um, and I just listened and just took it. Because I was like, well, if dad says this is what it's going to be, that's what it's going to be. So did you kind of trust that maybe he knew where your path would lead you? Or did you just trust him because he was your dad? That's the way it was. And like, I'm just going to have to deal with it. Yeah. So I didn't trust him because I knew that he knew <laughs> what was best for me. I was like, obviously you don't. <laughs> because it's like I had a plan. But. I, I, I trust him because he was my dad. Right. You know, yeah. and he was the head of the household. And the way we was raised, it was it was like, you know, so much emphasis on being like, you know, the father's the leader. Right. And so I I don't say I respected his decision. I accepted his decision because he made that decision for me. And I was like, I was a kid. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you're 17. Yeah. Basically, the, the thing that you love the most and that you're the best at is pulled away from you. And, you know, I think we tend to kind of gloss over things or laugh about or whatever, but that really set the stage for the next 17 years of your life Yeah. as far as just the anger and the hurt and how your relationship with your dad um, formed at that moment and kind of affected other parts of your life, which we'll get into. But I think something that's really interesting is that you eventually got to your a point in your 30s when all of that anger and that frustration with your dad finally came to a head and you had the courage to finally talk to him about it. Um, so tell me how that conversation went and also what what led you to that point where you're like, I can't keep this bottled up anymore. I have to talk to him. Man, so <laughs> I don't think I initially encouraged the 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 idea of talking to my dad. Yeah. It was more so I went to my sister's house for dinner and she she brought it up. And this is like, you know, I'm like 32, 33 at the time. And I'm thinking I'm over everything. I'm yeah. working like yeah. you know, I'm, I'm I'm where I like kind of want to be in life. Yeah. 
and you know we're having dinner and she 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 just brought it up like you know hey i, I just want to say i'm so sorry like how you were treated when you were a kid and she was like i felt bad for you and i got emotional i yeah. literally just you know started crying during the dinner and i didn't want to talk about it yeah. and i was like wow this is still affected yes. me like, in a negative way to the point where I was just like, you know, I got choked up yeah. and I just like didn't want to talk about it. And so, you know, I went on like business as usual. Yep. Like, you know, that was just like, oh, weird dinner, you know. Um, and so she basically um, wanted me to come to this forum that that she was a part of. And it was basically like helping you change the way you think and, mm -hmm. and look at life. And I was, I, I, I think I wasn't in a good place at that time, you know, business wise, things were going okay. Um, I just, the right after the divorce and separation and just like re, 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 redeveloping my life and my identity, just trying to figure out where, where, you know, life was going to take me. Right. And she was just like, Hey, I want you to come to this thing, you know? <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I show up. And, you know, they're talking about, you know, transformation, you know, like dealing with, with things in the past. And, you know, I'm like, oh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And she was like, I actually paid for you to go like in the next two weeks. And it was like six hundred dollars. And so I was she like, forced you yeah, to go, basically. Yeah. And I was like, that's a lot of money. You know, I was <laughs> like, you know, that obviously she cares. But like, what is this? Right. You know? So right. it was a three day, three day seminar, I guess you could say. And. During that whole process, they were just talking about like dealing with things in your past, talking to people, like how we create stories right. uh, about what what happened and then talking about what actually happened. You know, someone said something to you, you didn't like it and you were like, oh, they're being mean. They're just like hating on me or, right. or whatever the case may be, whatever you create and make up. And then you start to live out yeah. your, your life that way. Right. And it was like, you know, how about just go into that person and be like, hey, you said this. What did you mean by that? Right. And that kind of hit home because I was like, here I am living my life and I'm, you know, I thought I was okay yeah. and over it, but there's a lot of things that I ha I wanted, wanted answers. You know, I wanted to ask these questions and have answers. And so <laughs> here's the thing. I hate being told what to do. I hate being told what to do. And the guy was like, we're going to break for like 30 minutes. He was like, pick up your phone and call that one person that you need to have that serious conversation no with way. and do it. And I was just like, no, you're not telling me what to do. <laughs> so yeah, and the whole time that 30 minutes I'm fighting it. So I'm trying to find people to talk to, you know, <laughs> or whatever. And, and so my sister, she's been through this, so she knows, like, what's happening. Yeah. And so she, you know, afterwards, she was like, hey, did you talk to dad? And I was like, no. <laughs> she was like, mom? I was like, no. And she was like, I think you should. So she must have seen something over those years of you. And, and we'll talk about the other stuff that went on. But she must have seen something where it was either you were, you were angry or frustrated or sad or depressed and kind of knew that there was an underlying factor and it was mom or dad or something went, that went on within your family. Yeah. So she's pushing you to kind of get that out. Yeah. And I remember it was like, a, I think it was a Monday um, and she called me cause she knew my schedule. She knew I was done with, with clients. Uh, and she was just like, are you going to call dad today? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, I'll say like, I'm gonna call right now. And I, I really had no intention to call him, although I wanted to, cause I was like, how does this gonna, how is this conversation even going to happen? Right. Um, so I remember I walked around the building like three times looking at the number, call, hang up, call, hang up. You know? <laughs> and then I finally called him and got him on the line and, and, and just talked to him about like everything that, that, that was on my heart and mind and, and the, the issues that I had with him, you know, growing up. And I was just wondering why he was so hard on me. Yeah. You know? And I think <clears throat> the way I was raised, it was like, you know, like. The, that scripture, you know, children obey your parents and the right. Lord for this is right. That was always preached to me. Uh -huh. And that was one of the things that I felt proud of, you yeah. know, that, that, um, if you tell me what to do, I'm going to honor it and I'm going to go above and beyond. Yeah. And I've always been that person. And it's just like from the heart, you know, 
And I feel like I was doing that and it, it, I was just getting punished, you know, for making progress mm. or working too hard in this area. And it's like, oh, you're doing too much. You know, you need yeah. to shut it down. You're working too much. And I'm like, aren't you proud of me? I just got, you know, graduated like top of my class. You know, I, I, I graduated like high school with honors, graduated college, top of my class, you know, uh, started the construction company. We we're making over six figures by the age of like 17, 18 years old. Jeez. And it's just like nothing, you know, nothing was good enough. Yeah, just nothing. It was just it was just like, you know, you're staying out too late. You're doing this wrong. You know, like yeah. you're doing that, you know, and I just, I just, it was, it was like a heavy burden. So me and him just like, you know, we kind of like grew apart. Right. Um, and, and I just told him, I was like, you know, I kind of lost a lot of respect for you because it's like, here you are wanting us to be our best, but like here I was like giving you my best and nothing, you know? And, and I asked him why, why was you so hard on me? Like, and it was difficult. And it like, took you 16 years yeah, to ask, right? Yeah, here I am, like, uh, at the at the top, I'm, like, 33. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, asking this question, like, you know, and, and, and he was just, like, it was a simple response, and I respected it, but it changed, it changed the way I thought about life at that point. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> he told me, he was, like, my dad was hard on me, so I figured I'd be hard on you, and that was the way I was raised. Right. He was just, like, so I didn't know any other way. Mm. and it was so simple and I was like I respect that because it's like your your dad was like your roadmap to like parenting right you know yeah and that's all you knew you may not have liked how he was but you repeated the process right you know because you felt like oh I'm okay <clears throat> and a lot of things that he did <clears throat> wasn't okay to me and I and in, yeah, I have a son um so I have three kids and my son's nine years old and I thought about him. He's like, like spit an image <laughs> of you or your yeah, dad. <laughs> of me. And, 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 the, and the way he like acts is it reminds me of, of me. And my dad used to be like, <clears throat> he would say some hard stuff Yeah. that, you know, it just, it was damaging to me. And I, I thought about that and I was like, man, he was so hard on me. I would never want to be like, you know, treat my kids that way. And I realized, you know, at, at 33, I was like becoming this guy, right. you know, I'm becoming right. dad, like the person I didn't want to be, I was becoming. And then I realized that like he did exactly what his dad did, but I didn't have to do that with my kids oh, and I, I didn't that. have to be that same person. Yeah. So I was just like, I have to change who I am. And it took a lot of work, a lot of work of me working on myself and changing the way I thought about like, you know, how I saw my kids and my communication skills, yeah. um, and, 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 and being vulnerable with them and, and, you know, being emotionally connected and, and, and showing emotion, yeah. you know, cause I'm sure and, your dad did not. Yeah. yeah right? No, not at all. He was like the man of steel you know? yeah. and you just looked up to him and like, I want to be like dad. You know, I literally did like he, 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 he used to ride bulls, drove trucks, um, went to the military. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to ride bulls. He was like, they wouldn't let me do that. <laughs> I started driving 18 wheelers. I tried to sign up for the military. I got denied because I had high blood pressure and heart issues. So I just tried to do everything that he did. Like he's a pastor. I got called a preacher when I was 12. So it was like, you know, he was, he was my idol, like, like, you know, a man's man. Right. And it was like, you know, to, to try to follow footsteps of somebody that just like, you know, it's like shows nothing. It was hard yeah. because it was like, how do I become you, you know? So what, what was it that made you decide, I love him, I, I, he's my dad, but I don't want to repeat that as a dad to my kids? The, I'll, I'll, to be honest with you, it goes back to the child, my childhood. I was, I was always like that sensitive kid. Yeah. And, and my, my brothers, my other brothers, they're like, you know, like dad says, do it, go, you know? <laughs> and I was always the one that like think through everything, try to process, wait, maybe, maybe that just, maybe we should do it differently. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Why are we doing this? You know? And, and I was always like, I always had a heart And my dad would say like, you're too soft. Mm. He'd always tell me that. And we just got to kill. A little yeah. Kid. Yeah. So my entire life, I'm trying to be tough. Right. And then I realized I was like, you know, I just want to be me. Yeah. And so at that point, when he said that, I was like, you know, my granddad, he was a tough guy. He was in the military, you know, great guy. You know, I respected him. My, my dad was, you know, like what you call a tough guy. And I was just like, I, I'm not him. Yeah. And I, I will never be him, you know, but I can only be as good as I can be. Right. You know, 
And so I, I just embraced like who I was, you know, if I'm sensitive towards somebody's feelings and emotion, I'm going to be that person, you know, yeah. and I'm going to be strong in that area, you know, and not try to be something that I'm not, which is inauthentic. Right. You know, and so it, you know, it was so freeing, like to, to come to that realization that like, you know what, I am who I am and I'm going to be who I'm who, who I am, but I'm going to be a better version of myself by working on myself to be better. And I think that's so important, especially for boys, as they are told to man up, stop crying, don't be a baby, like literally shove emotions down and don't deal with them. And they go through years and years and years of not dealing with emotions until some sort of catalyst happens. Man. And something pushes them over and they do something tragic or do something to themselves. And like... I talked about it on the last episode, like women are more encouraged and we're, it's okay if we're crying and we're upset, but guys, oh, no, no, no. You you be a man. Yeah. You know, so trying to understand, you know, literally it took you 16 years to be like, okay, I'm not my dad. I'm not going to repeat that either and being okay with that. Um, But you had to do a lot of work in those 16 years. around around the same time that this was happening in your teenage years where you were told, hey, you're not going to go play ball. You're not going to do what you thought you were going to do your whole life. Um, You were also assaulted by an older woman. So I can't even like grasp how, as a boy, how that just would set you up for relationship issues and um, lack of self-worth and even more emotional stuff that you're not even probably allowed to talk about. And um, in fact, your parents don't even know this yet, yeah. right? Yeah. Like only a couple people? Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you for opening up about it. I think it's um, important and it's going to help other people heal as well. Um, so can you just kind of briefly tell us what happened and how that affected your other relationships in your 20s with women? Man, so at 17, like, let's go back to, like, the way I was raised because it, that that had a huge impact. Sure. Um, so, you know, saving yourself from marriage and being right. a virgin was everything, you know. And like I said, I was the kid that, like, if dad said, mom mom and dad said, like, this is the way to live, I wanted to do that right. and be the best at it. Um, <clears throat> so, I, you know, at the time, I think, like, my girlfriend, she was out of state. Okay. And um, so I did construction. So, I was, you know, I this started is, started the company. As a teenager, because yeah. you, graduated, you graduated high school yeah. early. Yeah, at 16. Okay. Um, okay. And I started doing construction. I was like an apprentice for my dad's friend at like 12, learned the trade, graduated uh, high school, started doing construction, doing general contract work, you know, by the age of like 16, 17. Yeah. And so, like, I'm working in and out of houses. I'm young. People don't necessarily respect me, but, like, mm-hmm. oh, he does great work. Um, and there was this bank manager, older lady, um, pretty well off, like, you know. Um, and so I'm working. And I'm, like, oh, I wouldn't say that I was, like, intelligent in the sense of, like, because I was homeschooled and, and not around, like, like the predatory. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, you know. So like you know I'm I'm just like all about my business right. you know and do and, a good job do a good job yeah and it was just like you know I'm in the house like you know, like like working and, and doing stuff so the ladies like showing me, me me around and everything and and she and then like you know there was a studio that we're working on and I'm just like taking care of everything and her husband's like like just making I have no idea what he did I think he was like, drugs or something <laughs> but they had like a half a million dollar home i was the contractor and and so she was just like you know asking me about like the, the this this room like the soundproof room and then shut the door and then just things just went haywire and like during that process i was just like i think i was scared because yeah. i was like this dude is gonna kill me and what's happening and it's just like and I didn't know what to do. I just like froze up, you know? Um, and after that, that whole process, I was like, after being taken advantage of, I 
packed my stuff up and I went home and I think I was just like staring into the distance and I didn't even like, like at that point it was just like difficult, you know, to like figure out just what just happened. And like, you know, like when it came to like sexual activity, like nothing, I didn't know anything about that. Never been sexually active. And you know, my mom was concerned, like, like, you know, days after and just like, are you okay? Like you just seem different, you know? And she just assumed like, you know, she was like, you know, two weeks later, she was just like basically assuming I had sex with my girlfriend. And I was like, yeah, whatever that is, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know? And she was just trying to coach me through that and going to church like day in, day, day out, like every Sunday and like having like, you know, like being preached at like, you know, like fornication, you know, like, like infidelity and like all, you know, just everything that had to do with sexual activity. And I was just like, I didn't do it. You know, I would, I would literally be in there to the point where my mom, she was like in church, she was talking about something you were like, like verbally talking. And, and I was just like, I was just trying to get my innocence back. It was so hard. It was very difficult. Um, I'm trying to get emotional. (laughs) Um, but it's very difficult because it's like you have a high standard and, yeah. and like, you know, I'm teaching at the church and it's like, I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't know how to explain that. I didn't know like, you know, how to get help. And so I just like indulged myself in work mm. and that became like the value, you know, because yeah. I felt like I had lost everything, you yeah. know, couldn't play sports anymore, you know, uh, virginity taken. Um, and so I was like, what else do I have left? Right. You know? And so my skill set was like construction and I just wanted to build homes. I just wanted to make them, you know, fantastic to people where they, you know, would just love them and like, you know, like my work. And I did that, you know, we, we had contracts for like Hilton all over Atlanta. We had all the contracts with them doing the remodel work, um, Hampton Inns in Atlanta. It was, you know, it, it was amazing, but I, th- like, that was my life. Like, I was killing myself. Like, 48-hour so like, work days, 24-hour yeah. work days, you know, set a deadline. I wouldn't sleep. Like, it was difficult. It was rough. And, and like, I couldn't talk to anybody, right. you know? Right. I think the only person that I knew was my best friend. And then he would always be so sympathetic, and it, it bothered me, you know? Mm. Because it's like, I don't want sympathy. Like, yeah, that happened, but, like, I'm trying to live my life and move right. on. And right. I didn't know how. Yeah. And it was very difficult because it's like, you know, like building things is what the only value that I felt like I had. Yeah. Like I'm valuable because I can like construct this this house, you know, and people love the house. Right. But like me, nothing. Well, that sense of shame, even though it wasn't your fault and you know, not, it's, I'm sure it's incredibly embarrassing still to even say and, and put it out there, but you have to, to start the healing process. And I, I feel like you're, you're finally doing that. Yeah. You know, even just you getting emotional, like you're this guy that comes in with all this energy and everything's so fun and happy. Like there's an emotional side to you. And if people can see that and know that it's okay that we all have those feelings. It's just a matter of how to direct them and what to do with them as you move through your future. That's what matters. What happened to you is what happened to you. Yeah. You can't change it. Um, it's only how you deal with it moving forward. And you had a tough time in your relationships with women moving forward, especially, was it the mother of your kids? Or yeah. Okay, so what happened with that? So that, that it was, you know... I feel like it, it was just a snowball effect because like love was, was had a different translation mm. and meaning to me at that point. You know, it's just like when it came to relationship, regardless of how I was treated because of like my value was like, I didn't really place a value on myself. Right. It was like, no, no, no matter how I was treated, it's like, as long as they like, you know, told me that they love me mm-hmm. and then were physically active with me, mm-hmm. then I was like, okay, okay, like, this is good. Good enough. Yeah, this, right. you know, and and that that cycle just, like, from, you know, from, like, marriage to, like, the relationship, you know, and that, that became, like, toxic and physical, like, where, like, she would, like, physically hit me and then I, I you know, you know what? 
I, I made a joke about it because, like, like, I always try to be lighthearted yeah. about everything. Yeah, you don't like, like to get yeah, serious, yeah, yeah, clearly. Yeah. yeah, so I was like, you know, like, like you know, I was telling my buddy, I was just like, man, like, I think it was around the Christian thing. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, dude, I was like, I said, man, like, if she keeps hitting me and I, I, I was going to stop her, I was like, I can't, like, dance my way back into the limelight like Chris Brown. And literally a week later, like, she, like, punched me. I blocked her. She fell back. And then she like her nose started bleeding, and then she runs through the 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 neighborhood and screaming that I hit her, and then I got arrested. What? Yeah, and and this is something that I've never shared with anybody because I was so ashamed. Yeah, like my entire life, I've like always helped people, always tried to do like you know what was best, and like here I am, like like arrested. And I was like, I had never been to jail before, and it was crazy because it's like this is how naive I was. Like like the cop is like taking me in like the whole the holding cell or whatever. So they literally thought you beat her simply because you blocked her. Yeah. And you're yeah. a bigger guy. It, well, I found out later that like Georgia law, because they have like domestic violence issues. Right. Is like they, by law, they have to take someone. Okay. You know? Um, so basically if she's saying I hit her, then like, oh yeah, I'm gone. And this is like, Jeez. I mean, dude, she's like, it's like a buck 20, you know? <laughs> so can wet. like, I'm, I'm like, you know, this monster of a person. I think I was like 100, like 280 pounds, you know? So it's like, oh, you predator. Right, right. So it was just like, it was just all bad. And, and, and so, you know, the, the, the charge got dropped and everything, but I was so naive because it's like, like they, they took me in and I was just like prepping for a show. And I was like, Hey, like all my foods in in like a, (laughs) <laughs> a tough thing and so I have to eat meals every two three hours oh and I was like can you take me back by the house so I can get my meals and he was like no he <laughs> <laughs> was like we can't do that and I was just like what like I was just thinking like oh man my career is gonna be over so I'm just like I think about everything yeah like I'm just yeah. that that type of person I think about like you know two days before five five years ahead right so I'm thinking about everything so I'm trying to still work everything out and that was like to, 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 to be in that situation was like so crippling. I think it was so frustrating because I lost like some major deals, $30,000 contract. I lost clients. I lost pretty much everything. And, and, you know, like couldn't see my kids yeah for six months to a year. Um, and so my life changed drastically. After Did that anyone day. believe you? No, it's just like, you know, with, with, like with, with her, like, you know, she just like, Oh, he hit me. You know, people, people literally like, you know, when, when they say, Oh, this guy hit, hit her or, or what have you, they believe that, right. you know, and then nobody likes that. So I was embarrassed and ashamed. Right. And I just felt like, you know, I'm already feeling like, like I don't have value in my value just dropped even more. I'm sure. So, I, you know, and so I put my energy into like my transformation in the sport but it wasn't healthy right. at all, you know, because it's like that was the only value that I had. And then like, you know, me working to get back to like a certain status, you know, and it was, you know, I didn't even bother to like explain anything or share this story. I've, this is the first time I've ever like talked about it publicly. Like all my friends was like, hey, just like quit competing. Like, just like don't talk about it, you know, and I was depressed for like I was sleeping in my car for like six months. Because, like, the conditional bum was like, yeah, we're going to let you out, but you can't go by the house. Mm. You can't, like, you know, see your kids. You can't communicate with her. And I, I felt like a criminal. I was right. like, what in the world? Like, like, you know, and it was just like, does anybody believe that I didn't do this? But it's like, no one cares. Right. You know, and so you have to go through the courses. So I was like, I was broke paying, like, for, like, for lawyer fees. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it took her, like, almost two and a half years to like say she was sorry really, and saying like, you know, I know you didn't do that, but like, I didn't know you were going to get arrested. And I was like, Oh, it's got it too late. You know? So you got divorced yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then you were, you just recently found out like a, a year or two ago that the charges were dropped. Yeah. So it was this year. It was like, so the, I forget when they were dropped, like in 2015 or 16. But I, th- I was so afraid. It was like, those those just hanging over my head. And so I went and saw my lawyer earlier part of this year. 
And I was like, hey, man, what if that ever happened to that case? Like, you know, I've paid you a fool for it. I haven't heard anything back. And he was like, one sec. He went into the back room and handed me a sheet of paper. He was like, the, all the charges are dropped. He was like, like, they dismissed the case. And it was just like, it was overwhelming. I literally, like, I, 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 I like, cried. Yeah. You know, because I felt like I had my life back. Yeah. Um, and that was hanging over my head, like, for so long. And... You know, I felt like, you know, it, you know, it's crazy because it's like to be a part of a system where people like, you know, actually commit crimes mm -hmm. and, and are a part of it. And for you to call and you're, you're trying to like fight to get your your reputation and name back. And then you're trying to go through like the legal. And then when when they pull up your file mm -hmm. and then they treat you differently. Right. You know, and that was crushing because I was like, no, 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 no. I'm I'm it's. You know, I can't even explain because they don't know me. Right. But I'm like, I'm a decent human being. But it's just like, oh, man, this is what you did. Uh, how can I help you? You know, right. the tone would change. The attitude would change. And I just felt horrible. You know, so it was just one of those things where, you know, you're operating in the world, but you still feel like in bondage to a situation that happened years ago that you don't have clarity. So when I got the clarity that, like, you know, it had been dismissed and the charge was dropped, man, I was like free as a bird yeah you know it was whew. so you had four kids with her yeah and you lost one yeah your oldest yeah um what happened so she was born premature she had pulmonary hypertension and it was crazy because that was the transition in 08 when the market had crashed. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing construction. That was my only source of income. You were killing it, right? Yeah, yeah. We were doing really well. Um, and then things just came to a halt. Um, the, you know, so the business declined. And, like, literally at that time, she was, she was like, 10 months. I had to change, like, careers because it's like okay i can't continue to do construction we went from like doing like three houses a month to yeah. three houses that year Jeez. you know so it was it was you know it was a big difference like financially like you know and then on top of that like i had purchased a home for like a family member and they kind of screwed me over on that deal mm -hmm. so like you know i had like collections loans i had three rental properties at the time you know, and I had to make a decision to save, like, the house and let the rest of them go. So it was just like, you know, you're trying to sell. Yeah. No one wants to buy. Right. You know, have to change careers. So I got my CDL, and she's in the hospital this entire time. So I'm, like, juggling between, like, truck driving school, trying to do the little bit of construction that I yeah. had going and yeah. seeing her in the hospital. What was her name? Um, Couture. Couture. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful girl. Aww. She was, like... She was like, she made, she made the rest of the kids look like, like, who are y'all? You know, like, that crying, like, you know, like she, she didn't really cry. And she was just like a happy baby. Although she had like pulmonary hypertension and like she had the uh, breathing tube, had an NG tube for food, had a heart monitor, you know, and I would carry that stuff around and like proud father, like, right. you know, nothing's wrong with my kid. Right. You know, that was my pride and joy. And so I wasn't, you know, at the time. And, and even still, like reality is reality, mm -hmm. but then not always look at the future. Like you know, five years from now, we like like you're, you're gonna kick this. Five years from now, right. we're gonna play in soccer. We're not even gonna, gonna know, great. think about yeah. it again. Yeah. So I was just so hopeful of the future because it's like you know your kid's supposed to outlive you, right? You know, um, and so you know I had all this this like happening, like you know, and then she didn't make it. Like I took her to the hospital. She wasn't feeling well. Uh, you know, she rarely would cry. And when she would cry, like, man, something's not right. Took her to the hospital. You know, we were there all night. And I remember telling her, it was just like, hey, like, whatever it takes. Like, you know, I made a promise to her, like, whatever it takes. I'm going to keep taking you to the hospital until you get better. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, five years from now, we're going to play soccer. We're going to laugh about this. You're yeah. Good. And she was just like, she was on the table just laying there. We would talk all the time. Like, I would always talk to her. And she just looked over at me like, I'm tired, you know? Um, and that broke my heart because it's like, I was like, man, I know we've been here for like hours, you know? Um, 
And so like, you know, I, I, the, the doctor came in, switched out the NG tube and was like, this is it. And I was like, no, I kind of know how to do that. No. You know, I think it's more to it, you know? And, and I was just like, Hey, we're going to go, we're going to go, you know? Um, and so I took her home and laid her down and every morning I would, I would like, you know, give her her meds, give her her shot. Uh, and, and I was on a, on a conference call with my electrician and one of the builders and we were working on a project and, I went to um, give her a shot. She was gone. Um, and, uh, crap, it's all good. It's okay. Yeah, so, um, it, that was tough because it's like, you know, it didn't hit me at the moment because I was like, you know, I got to be strong for, yeah. Her, yeah. for her mom. I got to be strong for everybody else. So I'm like, you know, doing CBR and I must have like, like until like the, the paramedics came, I must have like tried to revive her. And, um, the paramedics came. So I was like, Oh, they're here. They're going to, they're going to fix it. Yeah. They're going to fix it. You know? So I was so hopeful, you know, like, like looking back, I was just like, so hopeful to the point where it's like, you know, I went down to the paramedics and it was like, how is she doing? And, you know, and they gave me so much hope by the words that they used. It was like, we're still working, you know? And, and I was just like, you know, I was like, okay, she's going to be okay. And I, you know, I was just trying to like calm everybody down. My dad showed up and they took her to the hospital. Um, and so, you know, we went over to the hospital and I was still just like, you know, hopeful. And I heard a baby crying and it sounded like her. And I was like, mom, can we go back and see her? And she was like, you just don't get it, you know? Um, and that was tough. You know, that changed my life like drastically because it's like, you know, everywhere I went, she was in the back seat. Yeah. You know, I missed so many classes. Um, truck driving school to were the point to the point where my instructor he was like, I'm not letting you drive to take this course because you only drove on the road one time. He was like, I have no faith that you're going to get your CDL, you know? And I was just like, dude, my daughter's is sick. I was like, I don't care. He was really? just like, he was like, it would, he said it would snow in hell before you got your CDL. And I actually got my CDL that day, you know, um, and started driving professionally. And it was just like, it was one of those things where it's like, you know, you're dealing with a lot in life yeah. and then that happens, but you still got to move on. It was really tough. And, you know, and like, of course, the construction company, like, like that income isn't there. And it was a really t tough time in, lo in life because it's like, of course, the construction part just phased out. And that was like, that was like my kid. Yeah. Because it's like, I've been doing that ever since I was 12. That's what you found value in. Yeah. Right. And, and so like, I couldn't do that anymore. She passed away and it was just like my whole life just like shifted. How do you, like, how do you get up the next day? Like, how do you keep going? Man, for, to, to be honest with you, for like those 30 days, like I lost so much weight. I couldn't keep food down. Like, you know, every time I would get in my car, like, of course, I'm always looking in the rearview mirror. She right. was always there. Right. You know, no matter like before, like going out to the job site, like I'm, I'm, I, I always had her. And so I couldn't drive the car, couldn't be in the house, you know, and that's when I took the job, like, like traveling for work. Um, cause I, I didn't want to be home. I didn't want to yeah. be around anything. Mom came and packed up all the, the, her stuff, you know, and it was just difficult, you know, because like, you know, her mom was like on bed rest and everything like that. So I, I pretty much took care of her yeah. and raised her around that time. So it was tough. Um, but it wasn't in, you know, I, it, it, it wasn't until like six years later that I actually like got over it. Really? You know? And I, I, I wouldn't say got over it that I found the, the value in that situation. Yeah. How tragic it was, you know, it was like six years later and like I would, anytime something bad would happen in my life, I would be like, God, if you didn't take her, like, you know, my life would be good if, you know, if she was still here, Right. you know? And I would always blame that because that was like that crushing moment of my mm -hmm. life. And it was like, it was clear as day. I think I was doing cardio. I was prepping for a show. And the, I think, the, you know, and that, that's what really like got me to lift and like so heavy and, and grow and develop. So when people ask me like, how did you get so big? Like the, the honest truth was I, I couldn't, I couldn't, could not stop the pain. 
And so I would go and lift. Really? And I would just push like heavy weight. I remember this one time I did like, I did 50 plus pull ups until I just like collapsed. I, I can, I don't even remember. Like I stopped counting and kept going, but I was just like, it, I, I was in so much pain yeah. from losing her. And I just collapsed on the floor and cried because I, I couldn't deal with it, you know? And so like, that's how I really developed and grow. Cause I was like, you know what? This is a big negative in my life. I got to do something positive right. to release this energy. And then, so I started lifting and like training and I would just like, man, I would be in there. Like my old trainer would tell you like three o'clock in the morning, you know, um, there's your way like, to escape. Yeah. And he was like, what are you doing at these hours? You yeah. know? And I would just be in there just like pushing the weight. And because I, I didn't want to resort to like alcohol right. or, or drugs or anything like that. Cause it was, it was so much pain. I didn't know how to like yeah. numb it. Yeah. You know? Um, and you probably didn't go talk to anyone. No, right? I didn't. I was like, you know, the therapist, I'm not crazy. Right. You know? right? <laughs> At the top. You know? <laughs> so Gosh, everyone... People was like, go see a therapist. It's like, no, I haven't been admitted to no institution yet. Right. You know? Isn't that such a stigma? <laughs> yeah. And now you do see a therapist, yeah, right? Yeah. You do have Man. one that you love. And, and that's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Like yeah. actually seeing a therapist. Wow. Yeah. I, I, and you had told me that. She served her purpose and, and you learned a lot from, from her death and you carry her with you. And, um, you know, I, I, I can't even imagine what it's like to lose a, a daughter or a son or anything like that. But the fact that you now have that experience to talk to other people about is huge yeah. and how you overcame it and how you dealt with it and how you turned it in to a positive part of your life because it it's very easy to live in that negative space and place blame and poor me poor me poor me and you're a living walking breathing example of someone who's had all of this crap happen to them and you still push through Um, so what are your daily habits? Like, what do you do consistently to stay mentally well? And I know that you're going through the thick of some stuff right now. Um, but tell us what that looks like for you. Uh, on a daily for me, like, you know, a lot of people think like competing and, yeah. and, and like training is like, oh, Phil's fitness model. Um, he trains to compete. That was never the case. Um, Training is, is, you know, is, is self therapy for me, yeah. you know, um, it's like, you know, for health and wellness first and foremost, yeah. like, yeah, if I never step on stage next year, um, if I never like get, win another title or do anything big in the fitness community, I'm always going to take care of my health. Yeah. You know? So like at least 30 minutes of cardio, like for heart health and for sanity, right. you know, because it's like, it's, it allows me to process my thoughts, you know? get that blood flowing, yep. you know? Um, so, so cardio is one weight training is just like, is how I'd like let release that negative yeah. energy, you know, somebody yeah. cut you off. you like, <laughs> you know, you want to chase him, you know, I like, I do all that in the gym, yeah. you know, like I push the weight, you know, challenge myself physically because I told myself years ago, you know, I wanted to take like whatever negative happened to me, build something beautiful, sure. with it, you know? Um, so, so like weight training, Cardio, um, meditation yeah. has definitely helped me. Like I, at least 15 to 20 minutes a day. Um, and then scripture reading. Scripture reading is one, one of the things that like I say like through all everything that have happened in my life, like my faith is like have like brought me to this point, yeah. you know. Um, and, and that right there is like something that I think like you know, even if you're not spiritual, like to put something positive mm -hmm. in front of you every day to read or to, to, to absorb or to regurgitate like on a daily basis, you know, because it's, you know, it's reconditioning the mind, right. you know, negative is always going to happen always. every day, uh -huh. you know, something's going to happen, you know, and people always ask like, like, why do you smile all the time? Why are you happy? I was like, because it's like life is a party. Like at the end of the day, there's going to be times where you're going to have to cry. Right. There's going to be times where you have to be serious, but those rest of the times don't be miserable. Right. Enjoy, you know? Um, and I think because everything that I've been through is just like, 
life is short, yeah. you know, and losing my daughter, like, let me know, like, like life is fragile and you have no idea how long you're going to be here, but we all have the power of impact. You know, she impacted my life, like in a major way for mm-hmm. 10 months, you know, love and uncon- taught me how to love unconditionally um, and, and to like appreciate, you know? And so with that, it's like, you know, there's no reason for me to be like sad or to like harbor hate for anyone, you know? Um, And I think like everything that people would say, man, that's tragic what happened to you. Or man, I'm sorry that it happened. I'm really not, you know, at that time, I probably didn't understand it. And I probably was like, like, why did this happen to me? Sure. But now moving forward and like doing all the work that I've done, like, you know, on, on self, mm-hmm. it's like it all happened for a reason mm-hmm. and it's made me stronger as a human being and, it, and it's helped me to help other people. Yeah. And, and it like, you know, realizing like, man, this happened to me and I can just like take it and be like, woe is me, you right. know? And I could just be like, like, like be a negative to everybody that comes around. But like when you, when you actually like take the time to process things, work on yourself and develop from those situations, you're like, man, Maybe this may happen to me, but it happened to me so I can help other people. Exactly. You know? Because people are going through similar or even worse situations. Yeah. And sometimes I talk to people that, about this situation unrelated mm-hmm. and they're like, wow, my thing is my, let me just like work on this, you know? Right. So right. it's, you know, it, you know, to, to understand like, like those negative things, they may be negative, but there's always something positive to look at. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is hard when you're in that negative space. It's hard. Oh, it's to- tough. But Very you got to just pick one thing, yeah. one positive thing, and just focus on that, focus on that, and do that over and start repeating it. And it, it becomes, okay, now two positive things, and repeat that over and over. And that's why it takes so long for some people to get out of that negative space because it's not overnight, and they expect a magic pill or happy, you know, something to click and make them happy. And it's like nothing's just going to make you happy or make yeah. this go away. you got to work at it. And it's up to you. It's your responsibility. It's not up to anybody else. And it's kind of that sort of like tough love, like your dad, right? But but it's real. That's how you grew up. It's like, okay, I got to keep pushing through. I got to keep pushing through. So at what point did you finally say... Oh, do you want to talk to a therapist? I'm not, I'm not, you know, going to be thrown in a mental institution. And that's, that's why I'm going because I actually find value in talking to someone because I think guys are terrified to go talk to people. Yeah, that's, that is true. You know, it's not a guy thing to do. No, (laughs) it's like admitting that I'm broken. It's like, no, you're not broken. You're a human being. We're all just trying to get by. Yeah. The one thing we all have in common are emotions. That's the only thing. That is true. I didn't think about that. That is very it's the only true. thing. Yeah. But how do we deal with it? Yeah. That's so true. what was the point where you're like, all right, I need, I want to talk to somebody. Man, I remember just like it was yesterday. <laughs> I was, I was on the treadmill doing cardio. <laughs> of course, of course, you're doing cardio. <laughs> yeah. All these moments have cardio in common. Oh, like, <laughs> so note to self: if you see Philip doing cardio in the gym, something's going on. <laughs> yeah. Funny story about that. So like. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about like about therapy, but funny, funny story. I remember like before the divorce, the lawyer called me and I was trying to work out the relationship and there's so many things that were happening. And I was just like, you know, and it got to the point where I was just like, oh, I'm just all in. I'm just, let me work this out. And my buddy's like, you're stupid. Like you should just walk <laughs> away. <laughs> and then like I walk in the gym and, and she's like, in the gym with this other guy and I was like, oh God, you know? Oh my God. And so he was just like, um, he was like, I need you to talk to like this lawyer and, and, and talk to a therapist. Like, you know, and I remember like the, the lawyer was like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, dude, I got some Nike freeze. I want to lace those bad boys oh up and God. run. Run. <laughs> run it out. Yeah. So cardio is like how I dealt with a lot of stuff. So I was doing cardio and my um, the, the my ex girlfriend that, that that I was with at the time, I was like concerned because I was like, are are we good? You know, because it's like you know, it was like she was very distant, and and, and I was like, you know, you, I'm always trying to figure out like did something happen or right. what have you, and she was just like treating me like crap, man. And so you know, I'm trying to figure out, trying to trying to trying to work things out. And man, when I tell you, she made me feel like the worst I've ever felt. 
like like you know as a person and what'd she do um man she basically just told me like i was crazy for being concerned everything's good and she was like i was like well you keep sending me to voicemail and like i don't know what's what's going on right and then she was like you know when you're on a call with somebody she was like that's what you do you know like you know click the button like, yeah. and <laughs> somebody called while we we're on the phone and then she clicks over and i was like wait okay you can click over. Yeah, so i was like i was like you know like okay like sorry for like like bothered i just thought like something was wrong she made you feel like you're crazy yeah and then she just went off and then she was just like and then i was like hey i gotta go train like one of my buddies here i gotta go train she was like if you get off this phone you don't respect me i was like what like no i really gotta go and then she was like making all these threats and i felt trapped right (laughs) right and my buddy's looking at me like yeah it's time to train and it was like, you know, and then she just went on and on and on. And it's just like, and I finally got off the phone and I was just like, man, I don't want anybody to ever make me feel this way ever again. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't a, like, like she could do whatever she wanted to do and talk to whoever she wanted to talk to, however she wants to. Right. But I, I didn't want to allow anybody to ever make me feel that way. And I felt like I allowed her to make me feel that way because I was in a relationship with mm. her. And, you know, it goes back to like, you know, like the past, yep. like me being in those toxic relationships, allowing people to talk to me because like I didn't feel value or self words from, you know, that the being taken advantage of right. at 17. So I was like, I called my buddy up. I was like, dude, the therapist number that you're t- telling me about, like I want it. <laughs> so I think this is so important though, because you finally broke the cycle. Yeah. All these women, since you were 17, treated you like crap and you allowed it because as long as they told you they loved you and they slept with you, then it was fine. But it was finally like that pivotal moment, again, some random day at the gym when you're like, I don't want to allow anyone to treat me like that. But that is your choice, how you react. Yeah. And sometimes we need help on how to react to situations. So just being aware and cognizant that like, okay, this is happening over and over and over, like... I'm finally going to just man up and go see a therapist because I need it. Otherwise I'm going to keep doing this for the rest of my life. Yeah. You know, so that's like that, that such an important day that catapults you into this change. And like, I'm pretty sure you said it was about the same time that you also talked to your dad or maybe like right before that, Yeah. like kind of everything happened at once. Yeah. Um, when you're like, okay, I'm going to actually take control of my own life. Yeah, it, it it was like, it was crazy because like, and a lot of people don't know this, like when I decided to take, to walk away from the sport, yeah, it was to work on myself. Yeah. You know, it wasn't because it's like, oh, I don't think I can compete anymore or anything like that. I just didn't like where I was mentally. So these past five yeah. years, so you won in 2014. Yeah. And, and so past- I competed like up until like what? 2016 okay yeah and then uh, after 2016 i was done so it's like the last yeah. three years yeah the last three years like in a lot, no no one knows like why i s- decided not to compete and i tell myself i wouldn't step back on stage unless i was had balance like mental spiritual and relationship wise yeah. you know because i felt like like with me obsessing over like my body and mm-hmm. transforming mm-hmm. for the sport that I lost sight of like my mental state. Yep. Like that was important to me and my, you know, having a, a, a functioning and healthy relationship yeah. was important to me. I felt like I didn't have that. Um, and to, to, to be like, you know, stable emotionally yeah. to deal with certain things. And I was just like, you know, I sat down and I was writing down, you know, things I was good at. And then I started writing things that, that I sucked at. I was like, <laughs> wow, that's a lot. <laughs> And so I I decided to like work on things that I really sucked at. And so going to therapy was like life changing Yeah, because I was able to talk through a lot of issues that I just like swept under the rug, you know, and being a guy, it's a guy thing. You don't talk about it. You don't talk about it. You just move (laughs) on. I was like, you're okay. No, I'm good. You know, and you just keep moving on. And that stuff just builds up, builds up, builds up, you know, until like, you know, you either get, you know, like just horrible form of cancer or you commit suicide, right? you know? And that was a conversation like at the men's panel when I talked at WeWorks, we actually talked about that because the, and that was after I talked to my father um, and I was on the panel 
talking about masculinity. Yeah. What does that look like? Right. And what does that mean? And, and like toxic mas- masculinity and being vulnerable as males and sharing information. And I've, and I've found out like, you know, we don't share, you know, and we don't open up, you know, it's for instance, like you have a buddy and it's like, you know, it's like, Hey, like, like I didn't see you like a month ago. You right. were just ghosts. It's like, Oh yeah, I was just sick. Right. And then a year later he dies of like, <laughs> like a heart attack. And then you find out like he's been dealing with this for years and yeah. no one shares, you know, because you don't want to be weak. You want to be that tough guy. And so here I am dealing with like these issues that I was just like, hey, I don't want to be successful on magazines and, 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 and just like go for covers and, 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 you know, be successful in the sport yeah. and then mentally, emotionally and, and relationship wise, I suck. Yeah. You know? And as a father, I suck. I don't, I don't want to be that guy because anybody can be good at one thing. You can throw a ball, you know, for all your life and be a right. great quarterback right. and be a horrible father, be a horrible friend, you know? Um, and I didn't want to be that, you know, and it, it took a lot of work for these last three years. <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot of work, you know, failed relationships, you know, like, you know, like <laughs> moments where I was just like, well, I, I want to quit. This is too much, you know, um, dealing with anxiety, facing that, those yeah. fears, um, you know, depression, dealing with all of that and just working through it, meditating, meditating was so hard. Yeah. Um, I think for the, for the, the trying to do like five to 10 minutes. Um, it took me 90 days to like sit still, quiet my mind. I was like, wow, so you were doing I way I actually believe much. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as soon as I would sit down, I was like, oh man, a thousand things are coming to yeah. my mind. Let me shoot, get a sheet yeah. of paper, write it down. And then I would just go ghost. Like I would just like go do something else. Yeah. You know, it was so tough. But isn't it so worth it um, doing the work? Man, yeah. Rather than living the way you were living for the rest of your life? Yeah. It, it, it was like, I mean, this, it, this has been like the best transformation and people see the physical yeah. on social media. Sure. They see that, that transformation, man, the, the, the mental and spiritual transformation has been by far the best transformation like ever. And, and it, it has been the most work too, mm-hmm. you know, physical, you just, you know, burn some calories, right. you know, lift some weight, right. and, you know, and the body changes, you know, but like. Like t- t- taking yourself out of like that toxic environment. I think what really hit home was after winning all those trophies and and like I feel like I've been in like five to seven magazines and my mom has those and signing those for them and I went home to an empty apartment. You know, oh. lights were off and I'm sitting there and everybody's on social media coming and like share. You know, and saying like you know, man, you look amazing and great. And here I am, like, no relationship. Yep. Mentally just all over the place. Yep. And it sucked. And I hated that. And I was just like, what does all this, these followers and likes mean Nothing. if, like, I don't have anything outside of, like, my physical attributes, you know? And that's when I was like, man, I want to change that. I don't want to be that person anymore. And and so I just like, I, but like, like I'm done. Like until I can balance all that, I'm done. Like you know, I want to be a better father. I want to be a better person. You yeah. know, um, and I want to treat people how I want to be treated. Yeah. You know, and mentally, I want to like, because I, I was, I looked at, it, I was like, I invest so much time, energy into weight training and dieting and or, or what have you, and I was just like, my, my mental is way more important totally. you know, than that because yeah. it's like. My mind is what's going to keep me alive, you know? Yep. And so me and my therapist, we've done a lot of work, a lot of work, you know? And I would say, like, like you know, dealing with, like, like emotional intelligence, like empathy, you know, mm-hmm. dealing with, like, um, you know, like my past, deal, you know, talking about that rape and how that uh, affected me relationship-wise. Yeah. Um, you know, wanting a relationship that, you know, that where someone respects me right. and not just say that they love me or love me, mm-hmm. you know, but respect has standards, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. love is just like, you know, I love you. Oh, I did something bad to you, but I still love you. Right. You know, respect is I won't, I won't hurt you, right. you know, because I respect you and I also love you. I you love know? That. And so it was just like working on that, you know, it, it, you know, it's been a journey, but it's been great. I, uh, you're incredible. I don't, we haven't known each other that long. Um, and everyone sees the physical, but I think now hearing the spiritual and the, the mental side of what you had to go through 
and how you are still very much coming out the other side, I can honestly say that your hundreds of thousands of followers and likes mean nothing, but everyone that hear this story, you're going to make such an impact on, and that means more than I can ever tell you. And I'm nobody, but I'm proud of you. Thank you. So thank you for being on. So that was just part one of Philip's story. We had so much to talk about that there is a part two. Make sure to listen to that next. If you're enjoying this series, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Six Feet Above. I'm your host, Megan Armstrong. Subscribe so you never miss another episode. And follow me on Instagram at Six Feet Above Podcast to keep the conversation going. Tune in next week for a brand new episode. This episode is a product of Audiographies, produced by Denor Sapolia, edited by Jacob Smolian, and the music was by Keenan Willis, funded by yours truly. I'll see you next time.